We're in Mark chapter 7. And what is the shortest gospel? It's a fast-moving gospel. What you find is everything is immediately and immediately and immediately. And he's and just one thing after another after another. And we're looking at the life of Jesus Christ, the God-man, as he's just performing miracle, as he's healing people, as he's doing things, teaching parables. And, uh, and, and we get to this chapter 7, and, and we really have a lot of different challenging things. So if you, if you kind of pick and choose what Jesus said, you can make all of it sound really, really encouraging. Whereas if you just kind of go through it, you realize Jesus not only was a great encourager, he also had a lot of challenging things to say. And so in Mark chapter 7, we're going to run into some of that. So have you ever considered, you know, if you think in your mind, have you ever considered dismissing God, just going, man, forget this, like I'm done, I've had it, I don't want that, I'm, I don't think he's smart, good, wise, anything like that. The reality is none of us ever think that, right? That's total heresy that we would think that. But maybe in more subtle ways, we have dismissed God. Maybe in ways that we're not even aware of this morning, we're currently dismissing God. That is, that he says things and we say, no, I've already got other things that I'm doing that keep me from doing the things that he's saying. What you find in Mark 7 is you had a lot of religious people and what they were doing in all of their religious activities, they were actually using religious activity as a way to dismiss God rather than draw near to God. And as we wrestle through this this morning, and we're going to look at dismissing God, I hope each of us are wrestling with this idea of, could I be dismissing God in things that I'm currently doing, in ways I'm currently thinking, in ways I'm currently acting? Are there things in my life that, while I would never say, man, forget you, God, are there things that I'm doing right now that really betray my heart, that that is how I think in terms of God in this area of my life or that area of my life? And so... I want us to see that in Mark 7 today, but first let's review. In chapter 1 in Mark, Jesus came and his primary message was, his primary reason was he came with a message, right? In chapter 2, we saw he came for some. He says, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, those who recognize their absolute neediness before God to have his righteousness and not their own, right? Chapter 3, he called them family. Chapter 4, they were the truth seekers. He said some hard things. A lot of people wanted to hear Jesus until they heard the hard things, and they turned away. But those who kept going were the true truth seekers, and they were the ones that uh, the called and the ones that had become family. There are truth seekers. Chapter 5, he came to heal. Sometimes we think, well, healing was in the Bible and only certain circles of Christianity these days sort of believe in healing, and that's not true. Jesus heals today. We pray and we watch and we know that God heals today like he healed back then. And so we should be prayerful and watchful and, and we should know that he is the great physician. He still heals today. Then in chapter 6, we saw surprising unbelief. That is, Jesus goes back to his hometown where they knew him, where he was so familiar that they absolutely rejected him. And the concern is that we said, we can become so familiar to, G to Jesus, it, it's, it, that familiarity can breed contempt in our own life. Well, he walked on water, oh, he raised the dead. What time's lunch? You know, it, it just if we're not careful, we can let the familiarity to these things really breed contempt rather than love and obedience. And so we've got to be careful that we pursue him and that our hearts stay inclined to go after him and love him and cherish him and treasure him and not sort of slip away into just, oh, I've heard this, which leads to Mark chapter 7, where we're going to look at dismissing God. And so he says this in Mark chapter 7, verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the scribes, let's stop there real quick. Remember the Pharisees and Sadducees? One is the conservatives and one is the liberals. The Pharisees are the conservatives, right? They not only have the rules that God gave, they got a whole bunch more rules. They had the Talmud. They had all kinds of rules. Now, the Pharisees believed in literal heaven and hell. They believed in angels and demons. And uh, so they took the Bible literally. The Sadducees were the liberals. They didn't believe in a literal heaven or hell. They didn't believe in angels or demons. And so they were the ruling aristocrats. And, and strangely enough, you can see these things play out in our own culture. And they were secular, even though religious. They were uh, secular in the sense that they didn't buy into any of it being literal. Whereas the Pharisees believed it all to be literal. So you have these two camps. And they're both claiming to be spiritual. They're both claiming to some understanding of God. And yet Jesus comes into that. And which camp liked Jesus? Neither camp liked Jesus. He was hated by the conservatives and he was hated by the liberals, okay? 
So in this case, we're talking about the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him, that is Jesus, when they saw, when they had come from Jerusalem. So they're coming on the mission to try to listen and figure out what Jesus is doing, to try to trap him in some way. And in had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. Notice he doesn't say, thus observing what? The Bible. He says, thus observing the tradition of the elders. So this was just tradition passed down. So what you did in the Jewish mindset, it wasn't for germs, all right? It wasn't like, well, man, they didn't have a little pump thing to, to you know, get the antibacterial stuff out there and clean their hands. It wasn't germ-wise. It was a purity issue before God. So it was a ritual cleansing. And so what they had to do is they had to have, pour, have someone pour water on their hands with their fingers up. And the water had to run off of your, your uh, wrists. And if, as long as the water ran off your wrist, then you tip them over and with your fingers pointed down, someone pours more water on. And then you have to clean them one hand with the fist of the other hand. And this was a ritual cleansing. And there are religions that still practice that today. If you go and they have these ritual cleansings and, uh, and yet at the same time this is what the Jews are looking at Jesus going wait a minute <laughs> you're breaking our rules for them that was the same as going against who? God and when they had come from the marketplace they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves and there are many other things which they have received in order to observe such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots so they had actually all kinds of things they combined into the Talmud and what it was was what they called was fencing the law in other words okay so if that's God's standard then I better create a bunch of rules so I don't even come up against or bump into God's standard and therefore I can keep myself pure but what it really did was it replaced God's standard with their own humanly attainable standard. And so he goes on, he says, um, the Pharisees, verse 5, and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And so you get the point. He's saying, this doesn't even make sense. We've got all these rules, and you're not going by them. Your disciples aren't going by them. You're, therefore, in our opinion, going against God. Which is ironic since they were talking to who? God, right? So they're accusing God and they're saying, man, you don't do this. You don't wash your hands. And if, if you were actually to go to a Catholic church this morning, you might be able to watch some of these same practices, right? Did Jesus do these practices? No. Did his disciples do these practices? No. In fact, when pressed on it, you listen to this, because Jesus, when pressed on it and said, you are failing to do all of these things that you should be doing instead of going oh man i am so sorry. like i forgot about that ah, like I, i'll go back i'll just i'll teach my disciples to do this we should totally do that that's not how he responds he says this verse six and he said to them rightly did isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites wow does that mean that isaiah was actually thinking of them when he wrote this no He's saying that just like Isaiah took it to the hypocrites in Isaiah's day, he says, you're just like them. By the way, being called a hypocrite wasn't like a favorable thing back then any more than it is today, right? Nobody likes to be called a hypocrite. It means literally a play actor, like you're acting like this is all, like you're all into God and you're really not, right? He says, as is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Did you get that? They were preaching and teaching only for one cause. For themselves. It was all about man. Do you mean that people are actually going to church services and these things, at least in that day, and going, and really all they were getting is man-centered junk? Tradition, rituals, all kinds of ritual things that look very spiritual? but have no value. Well, that's how Jesus viewed it. Think that could still be going on in our day? A lot of ritual stuff that has no, nothing to do with God that people go through in order to feel spiritual, but really, while they go through this, their heart has nothing to do with God. They don't love God at all. Neglecting, verse eight, the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. You see, you'll hear a lot of times, well, these are traditions and they're really good and obviously we don't have a lot of traditions here since we have 
punching bags lined up alongside here and the martial arts rules there. You know, we don't have a real traditional service or anything like that. But at the same time, we need to be careful because what happens is a lot of times we set up rules in our hearts. We set up traditions. This is how we've always done it. And in reality, it may have nothing to do at all with God. And one of the questions we need to ask in our own heart is, we do a lot of things, many of the things we might have been doing since we were kids. Some of them we might have only been doing the last five, ten years, whatever it is. We need to ask ourselves, am I doing these things because I love God, because I'm just overwhelmed by the fact that this God loves me, that he forgave me, that he gave me his spirit, or am I just going through some ritual or routine where I really don't feel any love for God? Because that's where they were. He goes on and he says, and he was saying to them also, verse 9, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God. Is this a good thing? He says, man, you not, only, you not only have some ways that you set aside the commandments, like you're an expert, like you're professional grade at disregarding what I've said. Now keep in mind, these were the conservatives. These people believed the literal interpretation of the Bible. These people were hardcore religious men in every aspect. And, and, and you've met some people like that. Like everything, man. They're just like super religious. And Jesus comes and says, man, you're professional, great at dishonoring and rejecting and dismissing God. What? Could you have people that are ultra-religious and all they are is ultra-good at dismissing God? Verse 10, for Moses said, honor your father, and he gives an example here, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. So remember back in, right after the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, in chapter 21, he says, man, if you don't honor your father and mother, we kill you. Hmm. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that you would be held by is korban, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Now get this. So if somebody got frustrated with, somebody got angry at their parent, and basically they could use this ritual and say, man, I'm dedicating this to the Lord. And this, this korban was, I'm dedicating it to God. Now that didn't mean you had to take it all right then down to the sanctuary and give it over to the priest, nor did it mean that you couldn't actually just keep it and keep using it. It just meant that, oh, you couldn't give it to your parents, you couldn't give it away to anyone else. You, you use it until you gave it to the priest. And this was this way that they could, if they didn't want to help out their family, they didn't love their family, they didn't honor their parents, when their parents got older and needed help, instead of helping them, oh, I'm sorry, I've already dedicated to the Lord. And he says, you have just, by your rules, completely done the opposite of what God had said. God said, I'm so serious, he says, that you help your parents, that you help your family, that if you dishonor them, you deserve to die in my eyes. You have flipped this around and said, hey, you can be so dedicated to God that you don't even need to help your parents. And they flipped it over, right? And I think we should be asking and wrestling in our own hearts about ways that may seem normal to us in Christianity but maybe they're not normal when we compare it to the Bible. Maybe there's things that we've dismissed about God and his word, and maybe we've come up with rules that really allow us to feel comfortable, but really don't in any way follow what God said. Certainly they needed to think through that. And the strange thing is once they committed to it, they would use Numbers 30, verse 2, and since a vow made to the Lord couldn't be broken, they'd say, oh, he's already committed this to the sanctuary, so he can't help you, I'm sorry, because he's got to keep his vow to the Lord. So they so upended this thing that they actually totally dishonored God with their life and used scripture to validate their dishonor as though they were honoring. So we need to be careful, right? So in dismissing God, they not only dismissed his commands, but then secondly, they dismiss his standards. In verse 14, he starts off, after he had called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if, he goes in, if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are that which defiles the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. It's in parentheses there because it's not in the Adrian, it's not in the, the most reliable manuscripts. It was probably a, a scribal note after the fact. But verse 17, when he had left the crowds and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking understanding also? In other words, are you so dull? They should have understood this, right? So, so literally, they had this view that like, what you ate really affected your spiritual life. 
Now, let me tell you, if you eat a Big Mac, you're not, no one's going to look at it and say, man, you are just so wise. Like, living off of Big Macs, it's a wise decision, isn't it? Nobody's going to claim that you're super wise for you living off of Big Macs. But it doesn't defile you spiritually, right? Eating Big Macs or eating greasy food or whatever it is, what goes into your mouth doesn't defile you. And uh, what defiles you, Jesus says, is what comes out. Listen to this. He was saying to you, lacking, are you, are you still so dull? Verse 19, because it does not go into the heart, that was the center or the soul and the heart are all, so the center of the, our being, but into a stomach and is eliminated, thus he declared all food clean. This would have blown the Jews out of the water. They don't eat pork, there's a whole kinds of things they don't eat, and Jesus comes in and says, man, what are you, what are you doing? Right? Uh, you know, so you're all concerned about all this food, and by this he declares, he says, man, it doesn't matter. Like, there's nothing you eat that's going to defile you. There's nothing that you eat that's going to make you in a worse position with God or in a better position with God. So if you vape, does that put you in a better or worse position with God? No. It goes into your lungs. It goes in, you doesn't, if you eat, whatever. Now, there are things that you might go against your conscience, right? If you're going, man, God doesn't want me to drink coffee. I'm going to drink it anyway. Wait, is that a sin? Yeah, it's sin, because you believe that God didn't want you to do it, and you did it anyways to him who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it to him, it's sin. When we go against our conscience, it throws off those guilt singles, because we literally think, God doesn't want me to do that, we do it anyways, it's sin to us. But it's not sin because God cares whether you drink caffeine. It's not sin because God cares whether you eat greasy food or not, right? And some are like, ah, you know, the temple of the body, you know, body's the temple, and you know, all that. I'm not saying go trash your health. I'm saying it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect your spiritual well-being. And maybe, in the end, we'll go, dude, I wish I lived off Big Macs because I can see Jesus sooner. You know? Who knows? But the fact is, the, the, the fact is, it only matters that you're right with God and your food and what you eat is not that, right? From within, Verse 21, out of the heart of man proceed this. Now, he says, so we had a different, we broke God's commands. They were breaking God's commands. They were dismissing God's commands. Next, they dismissed his standards. They set up all these standards. You couldn't eat this, and you couldn't drink that, da, da, da. And he says, no, 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 wrong standard. Here's my standard. From within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, fornications, that's pornea, where we get pornography, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile man. You want to be defiled before God? You want to have God look and say, that's sin. You are dirty in my sight. It's from what comes in. It comes out of your mouth from within you, not what you're taking in and eating, right? When you're thinking in terms of, and your mind is running to greed and selfishness and foolishness and, and stupidity, when you're saying things and whatever's coming to your mouth, because your, your heart uh, will always be betrayed by your mouth. You say, well, I can hold it in. No, I, I'm not, I, can, I can have a heart that doesn't love God, and yet I can play this game. That's the hypocrite, right? But you know what? Your heart will always betray you because sooner or later, your mouth is going to open up and the junk that comes out is going to betray you and it's going to be betraying me, right? So what we need to be doing is working on the heart. That's what God's been after the whole time. Like literally, God sees himself and says, man, I'm this God who spoke into existence all of these millions and millions of galaxies. I'm the one who gave you life and health and everything to enjoy. And, and, and he's wanting to have a close communion and a love relationship with us where we receive his love and forgiveness and grace and righteousness and we respond with going, man, praise God. I love this being we call God. I, I, I just can't wait to meet him. It's amazing that he loves me, that he's with me. He expects that. He expects that. So much so that when we kind of take him and go, huh, he has problems with that. He has problems with that. But uniquely, while all of these religious conservatives were dismissing God's commands, they're dismissing God's standards, we have this beautiful picture of someone who doesn't in verse 24, the Syrophoenician woman. So verse 24, Jesus got up and went away from there to a region of Tyre. 
Tyre was in Phoenicia or modern day Lebanon. So he leaves Jerusalem. He goes, and we don't know how far he went into this Gentile territory. So he's talking about washing and everything because when you went to the marketplace, you might run into Gentiles or you might run into Jews who weren't ceremonially clean and so you had to go through all the ceremony. He literally goes there where around all of these people and reaches out to some Jews. There were still a lot of Jews living in Phoenicia. He goes there to start reaching out to them. And really this is a reflection again of how he dismissed everything that they held so dearly and they were so intense about, Jesus couldn't care less about. Everything the Pharisees were like, this is so important. Jesus was like, I don't even like that. Mm. And he says, but after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now, when you read this, I'm just telling you, it might strike you as odd how Jesus handles her. Listen to this. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Think that would have stung a little bit? Jesus, please, please help me. My daughter, she's demon-possessed. Please, please. And Jesus, I'm talking to the Jews here. Do you think it's right that I come to you before I come to them? Do you think it's right that I take their food and throw it to the dogs? You go, wow, there must have been some way that that sounded okay back then. It didn't sound okay back then, right? Didn't sound okay back then, right? And in our day, would that sound okay? Hey, dog. Well, if you're a rapper, I guess. But the, the, the idea, it was offensive, right? Yeah, the, 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 it was offensive, and it would be to us too. And yet, this woman isn't put off by it. Listen to her response. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord. But even the dogs on the table feed on the child's crumbs. He says, yeah, so, so I'm a dog and I'm unworthy. But, but kids often drop things and the dog can eat it off the ground. I'm the dog, but I, can I eat the crumbs off the ground? Wow. Check this out. And he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter, right? And going back home, she found the child laying on the bed and the demon, demon having left. You know what she said? She's basically coming and going, I, if, 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 I'm, if I'm that dog, you know, then would you bless the dog with crumbs? Now, ultimately, he, he leads this to the point where he's, he's showing that he came for the Jews, but the Jews were to be the disseminating the gospel, and ultimately would lead to the point where he shows that all people are equal under the gospel, and yet he really presses some points, doesn't he? You see, I think there's a lot of times we look at these truths and we go, man, if God is like that, then I wouldn't even follow him. Okay. That's just what the Pharisees or Sadducees said. But this Syrophoenician woman said, whatever you're like, I'm following. Whatever you say, I'm in. Whatever you do, I'm good. There was no argument. There was no discussion. They, she wasn't dismissing anything. In fact, she had this lowly position. She said, if that's the position, like, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm eating the crumbs. Please give me some crumbs. That's the approach to God, right? If you take the Bible for what it's saying at face value, you'll find there's a lot of things about God that will not set well with you. There's a lot of things about God that you will not understand. And if you don't believe that, you haven't read this book. Because, you know, we have these, oh, these cute little mobile in our, on our, on our, on our, stuck on our baby crib years ago. And it's got Noah's Ark figures. They're all just, you know, you crank it up. And it goes around and around and around. You know what happened? God killed every man, woman, and child and every living thing on this planet, except for a few animals and a couple of a people, right? And so, oh, that's so cute, and our babies watch, these things going around, right? But, but do you understand what he did? Like, that was, like, horrific. You remember what he did when he crossed the Jordan, going to Jericho? He says, by the way, keep anyone alive, I kill you. I want you to kill every single person. So if you haven't struggled with the reality that God is not like you, you're not like the Syrophoenician woman, right? She realizes, hey, whatever God's like, I'm in. Like, I just need you. And Jesus says, right answer. So in the midst of all of these religious conservatives who are like dismissing his commands, dismissing his standards, you have this Gentile woman going, man, I'm in. 
Well, he goes on in verse 31. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. And this is a strange thing. We don't have a lot of, uh, of, of knowledge about his travels through this area or what he was doing particularly. Mark is the main one talking about it. But verse 32, they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hands on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd. So does he do it publicly? No, he does takes him aside, he does it privately, right? Took him aside by himself and put his fingers in his ears. So you get the picture of Jesus like, sticks his fingers in his ears. And then if you're not so much for germs, you might not like Jesus healing on this particular case, you might prefer the ways he heals other people, but he says, puts his fingers in his ears and after spitting, so he just goes, spits on his finger. And then Casey, let me try this real quick. Be like, okay, this is kind of gross, right? He spits on his finger and sticks his finger, the spit, on the man's tongue, right? And touches his tongue with the saliva and then looks up to heaven with a deep sigh. He says to him, one word prayer, right? Epaphatha, that is, be open. So one word prayer, be opened. That's how we translate it out. And his ears were open and his impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly. So with all our medical advances, if you took someone who's deaf and dumb, can't speak or hear, and took them down to the medical center, what are the chances that they're going to be able to get them speaking and hearing perfectly? Not too good, are they? He immediately makes them so that he can speak and hear perfectly. And these were reflections that he really, in some way, Jesus was opening his ears so he would listen to him and allowing his tongue to be loose so he'd speak for him, right? That's really why he gave us the ears to hear. I gave his tongues to speak. Looking up to heaven, be open. And his ears were open. In verse 36, and he gave them orders not to tell anyone. So what does he command? By the way, I just made it so you can speak in here. Don't tell anybody that. You see, Jesus was not primarily a miracle worker. He was primarily the son of God with a message. And the miracle working was to validate the message that he actually came from heaven and was going back to heaven. But his main pur purpose here was not healing. His main purpose here was salvation. That's still his main purpose. That's why mainly it's about the gospel going forward and people getting saved because that's always been his main thing. And so you look at this and he um, gave orders not to tell anyone. But the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. Did they obey him? It made sense to them not to obey, right? The more that he told them, don't tell anyone, the more they told. Again, you see this dismissal of God, right? Strangely enough, now, God commands us to tell, right? In the Pew Research study uh, a couple of years ago they did, 50% uh, of evangelical Christians, evangelical Christians make up about 27% of all who claim to be Christians, evangelical being people who believe in a literal Bible, believe that Jesus is sufficient, his, his, that there's a, the, the atonement, his death, burial, and resurrection was to cover our sins, the stuff we believe, right? Uh, of that, half of Christians had shared, like 52%, had shared their faith with somebody in the last year. That's actually better than I expected. But the fact is, when God commands, don't tell anyone, they just went telling everybody. Now that he commands, go tell everybody, it can easily be neglected as though we don't tell anybody. But they were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And so you look at this, and you had this dismissal of God's command. You had dismissal of God's um, values. You ultimately have this Syrophoenician woman who just goes, man, I don't care what, if I'm the dog eating crumbs, I'm okay with that. Like, she's just okay with whatever it is. He's God and he has everything she needs. And she gets the response. Her, her daughter's healed. Then you have the next healing and again, right after the healing, they're dismissing God. So my question to us this morning would be this. Are there any areas in our lives where we're dismissing God? Because I think we live in a day where we have Christianity, and, and strangely enough, strangely enough, you have a, a lot of distraught, needy Christians, but we have in the scriptures a God who says, I'm going to come and take up residence within you. 
like the power that raised Christ from the dead will be operational in your life. Like, instead of unhappy, needy people, I think ultimately the gospel, when you review the gospel, when you look at this, you say, man, I think God intended for us to be joy-filled, peace-filled, purposeful people on a mission for God whose whole objective was simply to love God in response to his crazy love for us. So how do we end up in a, in a day and age where so many Christians are unhappy and so needy and they don't get it? And, and I think some of this has to be that we're dismissing God. Now, it may not be from a Pharisee side. It may be from a Sadducee side, right? It may be that we've bought into lies of the culture that says, hey, the culture says, hey, you, 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 you get chronic worrying. Well, that's just... It's a mental thing. You can't really change this deep, deep, deep. There's nothing you can do. Jesus is standing by the side saying, hey, don't worry about it. Stop worrying and start praying and giving thanks. You say, well, that's not even realistic, God, because I've already, what, dismissed that as irrelevant and embraced the title that the world has given me. Do you think sometimes we embrace the title the world's given us, and by doing so, we have to dismiss the power and authority of God's word? Sometimes we hear, well, these issues are so deep. Really? They're so deep that even Jesus can't heal it? Because up till 30 years ago, Christians, all they had was the Bible. Until psychologies rise, right? And it was sufficient for thousands of years to really win the battles and be happy, joyful, purposeful people. But now... Maybe we've dismissed some of what God says. Maybe we've dismissed the authority of God's word. Maybe we've neglected and walked away from, because you can't hold both. You can hold on to God's word and trust him, and it's hard, right? It takes the Holy Spirit to actually believe and go, no, I'm not going to worry about a thing. Why? Because God says he has it. It's going to take the Spirit to believe that. Do you believe that God has it? Do you believe he has your life? And he has everything under control, right? See, we've got to go back to the Bible. And instead of making up our own standard and saying, well, this is a standard. I don't, you know, I only dress conservative. I only listen to this kind of music. I don't, uh, instead of making our own standards, maybe we should just look at God and say, what's your standard? And instead of looking at it and going, man, judging one another like, wow, you drank wine. We talked about that this morning in, in uh, the equipping hour. But may, maybe instead of judging one another, we should just say, hey, what do I need to walk faithfully with God? And how could I encourage somebody else instead of judging somebody else like Jesus said in, or uh, James, his brother in James 4, says, don't judge your neighbor. Before his, before his own master, he stands or falls, right? He, they're just giving an account to Jesus. Don't, we don't give an account to, one, to Jesus about one another. We give an account to Jesus for our own life. We need to say, man, is there ways that, that I'm dismissing God and his word and his power? Are there ways that I'm, I'm going, not like the Syrophoenician woman, but I'm like these other people, instead of just believing and going, hey, whatever you said, whatever you're like, I'm in. Whatever you want, may your will be done. Like, you're God, I'm not. I'm just happy you wrote me in this story. Let's go your way. You bring it. Good, bad, otherwise, I'm just going to learn to trust you. Please do your Holy Spirit cause me to have joyful, happy life of contented peace while I go about your mission of going and telling everybody, right? That's all it is. It's really quite a basic life through the Holy Spirit that we live this stuff because these religious people, in this case, these religious conservatives, were all out to lunch. And it wasn't like, wow, this is proof we should be like the Sadducees and dismiss everything. They were completely out to lunch. It's simply a reminder that we can go through a lot of religious ceremonial stuff. We can get in ruts and do the same thing over and over and over and go, I'm godly because I did this and that. You're godly because Jesus gave you his righteousness at the cross when you believed and you walk in that godliness when you go, I can't believe it. There's no reason. This doesn't even make sense that God would love me, but he does. And, and, and that's how you walk in a godly way. You just go, man, his spirit is, is, is indwelling me. And, and then he, oh, turn left, turn right, turn right. And you're just following step by step. And he's leading you each day as you're just reading the Bible going, I'm on a mission. I'm supposed to tell everybody. They weren't supposed to tell anyone. They told everyone. We're supposed to tell everyone. We don't tell anyone. We need to do what he said, right? And just believe that he has everything he said to do everything that's necessary to make us complete in Christ. And it's all found in the word of God and it's not found anywhere else. So let's pray. Father, we come this morning and I'm concerned, even as I pray through this passage, 
for the areas of blindness in my own life. And I pray that all of us would really look at our own lives and, and many times we're blind towards our own blindness, foolish towards our own folly. So may we just be encouraging one another. May your spirit move in our midst, move in our lives. God, we don't want to be like the Pharisees. We don't want to be like the Sadducees. We don't want to dismiss your word. We don't want to create our own set of rules and standards and ethics. We just want to, like, we just want to know you. We want to walk with you. We want to love you. We want to be like you. We want to think like you. We want to talk like you. We want to look at things like you. And so we just thank you, Lord, even as we take communion, that you've already done at the cross everything to bring us into the family of God. You've already done everything to wash away our sins, to give us righteousness. You've already done everything to make us like you and and to give us all the resources so now we can become like you in practice, what we already are in our position. But God, we need you. Lord, if there's ways right now, I pray that even as we pray, that you would just bring to our minds ways that we're believing lies, ways that we're dismissing truth, ways that we've created our own standards, ways that we've justified or rationalized our disobedience or rejection of what you've said, or ways that we want to put you in a box or make you out to be who we want you to be, rather than like the Syrophoenician woman who just says, that's who you are, I'm in. That's what we want to be, Lord. We want to be a church of people who are just all in, who love you, who are on mission for you, who are just striving to live faith each day in the power of the Holy Spirit. May your grace be sufficient for these things. May your mercy abound in our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.